just a little bit longer just to make sure <coughs> everything is synced up and all the rest of it. Okay, okay, that's long enough. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to my uh, live stream. Thank you for joining me. Uh, usual requests, will you please like and share and all the other social media things uh, that you do. And also send me in questions, comments, anything you have to say, uh, please send it through. Before I start this evening, uh, I wanted to answer a question that came in uh, just after I'd finished on, what night was it? Thursday night. And it was, the question was, uh, it was from a person called Charlie who uh, said he's currently a Green supporter, but he likes our position on animal welfare and asked whether or not we would also ban uh, kosher meat, which is also unstunned as well as halal. Now, I do know that the far right have um, got a, they're being a bonnet about uh, Jews, uh, well, they, they're obsessed with Jews, aren't they? Um, and apparently we're all funded by Mossad and all the rest of this nonsense. Um, look, very clearly, it's my belief that the majority in this country agree with me on this. And that belief is from uh, listening to people. I genuinely can't think of a member of the public that I have spoken to about this issue who didn't agree with me. That the issue here is animal welfare and not religion. And religions change. They have changed throughout millennia. We are asking them to change again and to put animal welfare as a priority to them, to reduce, to find the compassion to reduce animals' unnecessary suffering. So in answer to your question, it's in our manifesto. I have consistently said it, absolutely all unstunned slaughter would be banned in this country under a for Britain government. We would repeal the religious exemption to unstunned slaughter. Now this, we have had rules against, or laws against uh, slaughtering animals without stunning, going back to the early 1900s in this country. But we have a religious exemption, which makes the whole thing entirely and completely pointless. It is allowing the people who actually want to do it to continue doing it, and only stopping the people who don't want to do it anyway uh, from doing it. So what's the point of it? What this is, is is essentially political trickery. It's to look like we are taking action on something while doing nothing at all about the actual practice that we are, you know, pretending to stop something while allowing it to carry on with impunity. This is a despicable political uh, trickery and that religious exemption has to go. Either this is about animal welfare or it's not. And if it is, then religion will just have to change. They will have to change how they process their meat. Final comment on that is that the kosher market is minuscule in comparison to the halal market. Kosher is not and never has been and nor have there been any moves to, not certainly not to my knowledge, been any moves to impose kosher on the wider public. This is not the case with halal. It is in schools, it is in hospitals, it is in across the public sector, the army even, uh, parliament. So we are clear, all unstunned slaughter, kosher or halal, will be prevented from taking place in the United Kingdom under a for Britain government. Thank you for that question uh, and for allowing me the opportunity to clarify that yet again. Okay, so on the lineup for this evening, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the coronavirus, a little bit of an update from what we heard from the government this evening. I'm going to talk about uh, Julian Assange for a while. Um, I've had a rather interesting day today in that I've spent a great deal of it reading about and watching documentaries about Julian Assange. And I went into it with a completely open mind, um, wanting to know as much as I, I, I knew, I, I could know about this, and coming away uh, with with very little clarity. He's, it's one of those issues where 
it depends on where you are as to whether or not you agree with him. I think there are major uh, arguments in his favour, arguments against him, um, but on balance, I come out on his side. And I'll explain in a lot more detail um, soon about that. Uh, I will also go through, <clears throat> as I was going to do on Monday, we didn't really get the time, uh, some of the Islam's teachings on women. And the reason we're doing this is because we uh, we know that the that uh, Sajid Javid back uh, in 2018 ordered a review into the ethnicity of the grooming gangs. That review is now complete, but it won't be published. Uh, the point of this is that we are looking at well, there's a few points. One, we are looking at ethnicity when we ought to be looking at religion. We have completely discounted the religion in all of this uh, when it's where we ought to be seeking because these are not an ethnic unifier uh, among the rape gangs, certainly across Europe, but there is a religious unifier and therefore we ought to be looking at the religion. And I'm saying that these, group, these uh, grooming gangs, these rape gangs, it's not a coincidence that they're almost exclusively Muslim. Uh, the contempt for non-Muslims and the contempt for women is saturates Islamic scripture. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that the rape gangs or the members of these rape gangs, before they go out to rape young English girls, sit down and read the Quran. I'm not suggesting this for a moment. What I am saying is that they are raised in a culture shaped by this religion. Even if they've never read the Quran, they are raised in a culture shaped by by it. And even uh, prominent Muslims like Yasmin Alibi Brown, whom I'm not a fan of, but to her credit, she did speak out on this. And she did say that there is widespread contempt for white women in Muslim communities in this country. So we'll talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about the Quran's attitude to non-Muslims. We'll talk a little bit today about the attitude to women and how the two things combined shape people's views. And that if we're going to look at grooming gangs with any seriousness, we need to be looking at the religion and not the ethnicity. Okay, so please do uh, get your questions in. Um, very quickly, uh, I was asked by Mia before I finished on Monday about uh, trawlers in UK fishing waters at the moment. So I want to just quickly uh, cover that and I'll post any, any articles that I refer to will go out on the For Britain Committee's Twitter account. So just to let you know, um, what's going on. At the moment, there are what are called super trawlers in UK waters, uh, two, three from the Netherlands and two from France off the Scottish coast where they're hauling tons of fish every day. Uh, they set off on towards, to, to set about this towards the Scottish uh, uh, coast only uh, immediately mm -hmm. after Britain announced a coronavirus lockdown. Uh, so we are, our fishermen are locked down and in the meanwhile, um, Dutch and French super trawlers are uh, roaming around the uh, Scottish coast and fishing and fishing and fishing and fishing. And an already uh, desperate situation um, for fishermen who are, who are uh, obviously and understandably upset about this. The thing is that they're allowed to do this. Um, and that will change. The government's response to this has been this will change after Brexit. When we come out of the common fisheries policy, people can still fish. And this caused quite a bit of fury. Uh, people can still fish in UK waters afterwards, but only under strict uh, circumstances and following the rules of the UK. So something that has has been upsetting people. But to me, you know, it's just it just seems to be just another one of those examples, doesn't it? I mean, the airports are still open. The airports are still accepting flights. Uh, we've got workers coming in from Romania um, and, and they're coming in because they're pay they can be che paid cheaper and, and, and several uh, UK workers did apply to to do the uh, cultivation, the picking the vegetables, picking the fruits, whatever it is that is desperately needed across the country, and the where the hiring of British people wasn't taking place because they were too expensive, and this I suspect I I can pretty much confirm is across the board and coronavirus or not, our industries are hiring foreign workers because they are cheaper. Um. Long term, medium term and short term, we have got to stop and change 
that. It is an issue. It is an issue. And it's an issue that started actually when we opened the EU to the to the eastern countries. And I'm not, you know, attacking the eastern countries when I say that, but it was inevitable. When you when the EU was Western Europe and you had essentially uh, Western first world countries, uh, same levels, standard of living, uh, same levels of wealth or similar levels of wealth. So that the the immigration between countries wasn't enormous. But then you open to the much poorer east and it's inevitable uh, that people will start to come in. Uh, and that was really when the, the uh, uh, practice of cheaper workers from Eastern Europe at the expense of British workers began to take place. And of course, when British workers were uh, inevitably priced out of the market. But that's where we are. Um, and only a change of government and only a change of the House of Commons uh, will really stop that. OK. Time is already flying and I, there's a lot I want to cover tonight. So let's get the latest from the government on uh, on coronavirus. So the government press conference was taken this evening by Dominic Raab. We are still in lockdown for the foreseeable future, although Boris Johnson is reportedly coming up with a plan and we may have some restrictions eased next week. Uh, but those restrictions are as restrictions even are likely to be very mild um, and largely hardly noticeable. Oh, one thing, um, we will be finishing again at five minutes to eight this evening to allow those who want to uh, clap for key workers at five to eight. Um, OK, questions coming in. Thank you very much. Um, Apparently, we're also having streaming issues and it is once again an Internet issue, but I will carry on regardless. Oh, it's getting a bit, it's getting, um, it's getting a bit much now. I mean, once or twice. Once is, it happens twice. Oh dear, has it happened again? Third time, you, you, you can't, you shouldn't let it happen a third time. You should do everything you can to prevent it from happening a third time. But uh, I've no idea um, what those issues are. And uh, let's see. Let's just carry on and hope hope for the best. So thanks um, for the questions coming in. OK, back to coronavirus. So uh, Dominic Raab has told us that abandoning social distance in rules at this point would allow the virus to spread again. However, both rates of infection, the rate of infection is down to, which is called the OR rate, is down to minus one between 0.5 and 0.9, which means that people who are infected are passing it on to fewer than one person, which is obviously a good thing. Um, so rates of infection are down, rates of death are down, but the social distancing rules will remain in place um, because it will allow the, according to Dominic Raab, if we uh, lift them now, the uh, virus may spread again. Um, quick warning, my dog is a little bit active this evening, so she may bark. OK, here's the news that we all knew was coming and we're dreading. And the news today from the Bank of England is highly, highly, highly alarming. They are saying that the UK economy will shrink by 14% this year. This is almost twice the last big crash. Uh, it will be the deepest recession we've ever had. Uh, you know, what is there what is there to say? It's it's in it's it's that I haven't that isn't already said in that sentence. We will see our biggest ever recession according to the Bank of England today. This will this will lead to death this will lead to great amounts of suffering um and we still we still don't have a a time or an indication of when our economy will slowly be able to get back on its feet there's there are huge problems huge huge problems ahead this is this is a catastrophic figure uh, um, and i don't want to over uh worry people we ought to be worried about this this is um we're going to have years. We're going to have years of suffering and struggling ahead because of this thing. And uh, we, I, I, you know, we have a petition. Please, please sign this petition. I'll again send it out uh, or make sure it is sent out on the Forbidden Committee's Twitter account. 
But uh, China owes us, so far, according to one study, £350 billion. Pounds. We need that money, and it's likely to be a far higher figure than that by the time we get out of this, before, by the time we get back to some kind of normal, whatever that will be. We will lose... <clears throat> vast numbers of jobs we will lose vast numbers of small businesses uh, and china is enjoying itself it's enjoying itself it's buying up shares in, in all over the world it is uh, selling f often faulty produce around the world it's making a killing on all this uh, while the rest of us are watching our economy shrink by 14 percent um oh you know you remember the ppe that we bought from turkey yeah, it doesn't meet our safety standards. Don't you love it? Isn't this just fantastic? This is what happens. I mean, we weren't even able to supply our own ventilators because ventilator production in this country didn't meet with NHS specifications. So we're going to, guess where? China to buy them. We have a manufacturing crisis. There is a manufacturing crisis in this country. We're unable to keep our own workers safe. Uh, we need to completely review where we are in, in so, so many respects. Here's an interesting uh, update from this evening. Now, UK government data suggests that black people twice as likely as white people to die. I addressed this in one of our unfortunately written off um, at live streams, again, due to, due to internet problems. I, I briefly addressed this. Um... OK, so we're, say, we're hearing that uh, black people are twice as likely to die as white people from this. OK, now there's a, a few questions and we're told that we're going to look into this in detail uh, and find out why this is. I want to know a couple of things before we start this. Number one, what kind of, what do we mean by black people? Are we talking about British black people or are we talking about immigrant communities? If we are talking about immigrant communities, is it partly, if not uh, largely, that many immigrant communities are refusing to follow social distancing rules. Is that part of it? Is it what the uh, British Medical Association used as an example in what I read out in, in on that live stream, the fact that religious minorities are refusing particular PPE because it it, it doesn't you know fit with the 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 headgear or the birds? Is that a reason? Uh, is it because, are we talking about, and this was something that was addressed by a statistician on the BBC who said that it was a part of it was because many ethnic minorities live in, in uh, crowded areas uh, or uh, living in rather poorer areas. But is, if that's the case, then it's a poverty issue and, and white people living in poor areas are subjected or, or overcrowded areas subject to the same things. Will, if, if, it fi if we find that this is a matter of immigrant communities refusing to participate in social lockdown, uh, then we then either this investigation will completely disappear, we will never hear another word about it, or it will be somehow spun and twisted to yet again somehow become our fault, white people's fault. It will somehow be down to us. Anyway, okay, that's, that's the latest on uh, coronavirus. Brief summary, at least. OK, uh, what else did I want to cover? Oh, yes, of course, Julian Assange. Let's spend a few minutes on him. And the time is, of course, flying by. I uh, went, went into researching this issue with, um, with great interest and I came away from it with a couple of, of uh, sort of, I guess, overriding thoughts. I made a few, a few notes on this. One thing that seemed prevalent throughout the various uh, news coverage of him, uh, documentaries of him, articles about him, is uh, that not many people have a very have much nice, many nice <laughs> words to say about him. Uh, he's been described by several people as reckless, several people as a narcissist. And the uh, division is, is an incredibly divisive figure. And, and I understand why. And I, I sympathise largely with both his defenders and his critics. It's a very interesting uh, case, this. But one word that continues to come up repeatedly, even by his defenders, I found, was narcissist. Um, and very few, if anyone, uh, from, from what I saw in, in coverage today, has anything 
particularly good to say about him. It's obviously got um, nothing to do with his right to free speech, but it's I, I found a, a noteworthy um, noteworthy reality in in researching this. Okay, so let's do a quick update and a quick summary of who he is and what he he's done. He founded uh, WikiLeaks, which is a uh, like a Wikipedia, but for people who have well, leaks, uh, and for people who want to anonymously post information to be made public. Uh, and one thing, and I uh, this, this is quite admirable, uh, was that he would never, uh, and something I found that was consistent through uh, discussion of him, he wasn't, um, he was serious about keeping the anonymity and keeping the, the protection of, of sources, etc. Uh, private. So this came, WikiLeaks came to international attention when they had published when WikiLeaks had published now I'm keeping a close eye on my phone just to let you know just to make sure that uh, <clears throat> just to make sure that there's nothing uh, telling me that I that the entire stream has gone down but just uh, I'll just keep a, a close eye on that so WikiLeaks published a video showing a, a US, US military uh, a helicopter shooting people, in, in a nutshell, on the ground. And there was sort of attitude of, ha-ha, I got them, and, and, and this kind of thing. And uh, this, this, was, this was leaked. And suddenly, uh, Julian Assange found himself... Um, in the middle of a, 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 a global household name. And WikiLeaks uh, suddenly found itself a household name. Now he was being given, he was given this video and uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of pieces of classified US military information by someone who was serving at the time named Bradley Manning. Now, Bradley Manning, who is now known as Chelsea Manning, who has undergone uh, sex change, was jailed for 35 years for uh, putting out, for, for sharing uh, information and was released by Obama, uh, but is, has been since rearrested again. Now, there is... Some of the communications between this is where part of the the grey area is in terms of of Julian Assange and what he could be charged with, and this is where a large part of of the debate around this is whether he was a journalist legitimately exposing information and protecting his sources as as journalists do, or was he? engaged in illegal activity according to US laws and collaborating for the release of classified information. This is one of those grey areas that this case really rests upon. And they're looking over his communication. He had a long period of communication with Bradley Manning. And some are implying or some believe that he had encouraged uh, Bradley Manning, who some say was sort of not... It was a troubled person, um, a, a lonely figure, a sort of isolated figure in in in, in the U.S. military, um, and that he was sort of exploiting this. I personally see no, didn't see uh, evidence for this, but it is one of the grey areas involved in what his role is, and what his role is, and what he was doing. Was he collaborating, or was he being a journalist? Largely uh, determines. Whether you know what what approach to take legally, what approach um, to take to him. So, moving, he continued, by the way, to to publish or oh, periodically continued to publish uh, information embarrassing to the to U.S. Um, to the U.S. establishment, um, and he, including, of course, Hillary Clinton. But before we get on to the Hillary Clinton section, in twenty ten. He was, Interpol issued a warrant for his arrest on sexual assault charges in Sweden. He uh, 
refused to uh, go to, to, to Sweden because there were no assurances for him that as soon as he got to Sweden to answer those charges, he wouldn't be extradited to the United States, where he knew he faced uh, pot potentially extremely serious charges and carrying a very hefty prison sentence. So rather than uh, go to Sweden and risk extradition to the United States, he went to the Ecuadorian embassy in London, disguised apparently as a delivery person and went inside the Ecuadorian embassy with a letter in his hand claiming asylum. Now, controversially, uh, Ecuador gave him asylum and he was in the Ecuadorian embassy for seven years where he continued to, exp continued to publish embarrassing documents, continued to work on the internet, continued to participate in interviews and etc, etc, et and, and, and have uh, a presence on the internet. In 2016, the uh, US election of 2016, he uh, began to be accused of working as a, essentially, essentially as, a, as a, uh, an agent of Russia. When uh, the hacking into uh, when when hacking resulted in the uh, embarrassing publication of uh, Hillary Clinton emails, he was accused of facilitating Russian interference by publishing these things. It's something it's, you know there was an insistence by the Clinton camp, for example, that it was Russia who was behind exposing uh, and and hacking in and, and exposing. Um, information from inside that it was Russia who had done that and then used Julian Assange and WikiLeaks as a publication platform uh, to interfere in the US election. Assange always uh, denied that and I whether I it, it's 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 um it's something that he, he has always denied, but it hasn't stopped people and didn't stop people accusing him of being a, a stooge for the Russian state. So he lost, uh, during that time, a lot of people's view of him changed a little bit. He'd gone from being a hero and a champion of freedom of speech to, in many people's eyes, um, an anti-Western stooge. Now, let me just uh, talk a little bit about my own uh, views on, on a lot of this. I don't think I will ever be a, a massive fan of, of Julian Assange. And uh, I do think uh, that he, his, his target appears to specifically have been the United States, and which is fine, uh, but he was in collaboration with the New York Times, he was in collaboration with The Guardian, uh, his defenders were people like George Galloway. This was a, he was very much uh, supported in his attacks in America by the extreme left. Uh, this to me, you know, when you target and single out America uh, without going after others, and I understand that the, the information that he had was 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 exposure of America. I understand this, but I did see uh, one particular clip of him, and I try as I might, I can't find it, but I know I I know this clip is there, and it was him talking to what looked to me very much like an Iranian mullah, uh, talking to him about the and I quote that he had been fighting the hegemony of the United States. Now, I'm sorry, but if you really are a champion of freedom of speech, then, uh, you know, you know, friendly chats about the, the awful United States with a, a, an Iranian mullah. I don't know for a fact it was an Iranian mullah. It was certainly a Muslim cleric. Um, doesn't doesn't you know? It, it seems to me that it's not so much about well it, about free speech per se, uh, rather than than uh, inconsistent attacks on the United States, which of course the left wing loves. With all of that in mind, or another reason he was accused um, of being a, a, a Russian sort of agent, not, not, not quite an agent, I don't think it was quite formal, but he broadcast uh, via RT and a lot of people um, were, uh, it raised eyebrows, Russia Today, a lot of people raised eyebrows about that. I don't particularly mind that a, a platform uh, is, uh, in many cases, sometimes obviously you have to have limits, or I certainly do have limits and draw a line, but sometimes a platform is a platform and you've got to speak to people. 
uh, and you will take platforms. I'm not really uh, concerned about this. But uh, overall, overall, here's, here's the thing. He was accused of uh, releasing information, names, uh, details of, of, of individuals, which many stated as fact had resulted in real problems for, for people. People who, uh, some people it was argued, had been killed because of the information that he published. Uh, some people had, uh, people who had been working for the US, for example, or even people, you know, people in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, who had been working for the US, had apparently uh, uh, had their lives really endangered because of information that he published. Uh, he also published, uh, or WikiLeaks published uh, the U, the um, BMP membership list, which I'm sure they would do to us as well. Um, do I think that a person should recklessly publish information that is unnecessary to get the point across. In other words, do you need to publish names and addresses for people in order to inform the public about certain things? I don't think you do. And I don't uh, particularly like the idea of um, revealing people's uh, names and details. Uh, and I don't think that it's always necessary if that person is particularly powerful. And this is, you know, and there's an instance um, that it's 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 vital to that. That's different. Um, but to recklessly and the word recklessly continue to come up. Uh, I don't particularly approve of. I also do understand that there are, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. And there are times when it may be justified. The air, of course, the uh, the uh, default position has to be transparency, but there may be times for security reasons when governments have to keep things quiet. This is the real world. It's the world we live in. However, having said all of that, he has a right to free speech and he has a right. I don't... I'm not his biggest fan. I don't think I ever will be. The party, by the way, hasn't got a position on this. All of this is my own opinion. Uh, our activists, our members are, as far as I'm concerned, 100% free to campaign either for or against Assange, uh, to speak freely and uh, however they feel about Assange. Um, absolutely no uh, strong party position on this. Um, but these are, these are my, my views. And on balance... Uh, I'm not a fan, but I don't think that someone should have lost their liberty for this length of time for publishing information. Um, it is a dangerous, dangerous precedent. And uh, interestingly, the United, uh, the Donald Trump during the election campaign spoke very, very uh, gushingly. Uh, about WikiLeaks and how he loved, I quote, I love WikiLeaks. And this is because, of course, they were harming Hillary Clinton. Uh, I love WikiLeaks, but now, now uh, Trump is in office, uh, the uh, US is now looking for him again. The he, he was, as I said, in the Ecuadorian embassy for seven years. The government in Ecuador changed to a government that was looking to build relations with the United States. And sadly for Julian Assange, that meant his time at the Ecuadorian embassy was ended. He was arrested by UK police. He is sitting in a British prison awaiting a hearing on extradition to the United States where he faces charges of espionage under Trump, under the Trump administration. He ch faces charges of espionage, which could see him a facing a 75 year sentence in prison. Now, America does not muck about with these things. Prison sentences in America are prison sentences. It's not like in Europe where you get three years and serve three months. Uh, this is America hands out serious prison sentences and you serve them. So he is looking at the rest of his life in a high security prison in the United States. His hearing is uh, postponed due to lockdown. Now it's due to be heard in London in September. Um, and we will see what happens then. Do I wish to see this man serve the rest of his life in a high security US prison? Do I think he deserves it? No, I do not. Not at all. Uh, 
is he uh, engaged in criminal activity according to the United States? Well, that's as may be. But let's not forget, even if the US can make the make criminal charges according to their laws stick, let's not forget that Julian Assange is not an American. He's an Australian citizen. Is he, as a journalist, and this is journalism, he may, even if he never called himself a journalist, he's publishing information uh, that makes him acting as a journalist and therefore journalism uh, principles apply. Uh, he is not, is it the case, if he is extradited to the United States and charged under US laws as an Australian citizen, uh, is it then the case that internationally non-American journalists who publish information about the US or the US government are then suddenly subject to US laws? There are huge, huge issues here. Is the US going after him out of uh, a, 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 uh, a revenge? We, we know this guy has caused us loads of harm. Let's get him. I suspect there is a little bit of that. My uh, so on on balance, um, I think what he you know freedom he he may have harmed people, but let's be clear, freedom of speech as long as it's true is freedom of speech. There are things that names of of people who are are are, are you know involved in this by doing their job, for example. I don't think names need to be published. Uh, on, if you can get the point across without naming people, then you should do. Um, and I do think perhaps he was somewhat reckless. I, I do accept that there is a little bit of ego going on here, but none of those means he deserves to spend the rest of his life in prison. He has perhaps caused harm to people, but the sad reality is that free speech, as long as it's true, is likely often to cause harm to people. And on balance, free speech is far, far more important and we cannot have it that uh, a person who exposes inconvenient or uncomfortable truths about the US government, whether or not, and about uh, affairs in, in Iraq and beyond, whether or not I like that person, I don't particularly, whether or not I think he caused harm to people, I do, uh, but he, this is free speech and he is entitled to it. And does he deserve long-term imprisonment for it? Absolutely, absolutely not. Um, and it'll be uh, very interesting to see what happens with him. But fascinating, fascinating story. Uh, and let's see what happens in September when he is up to be heard on his uh, extradition to the United States. Okay, uh, what else? Right, oh, this is what happens. You see, these things are so interesting uh, that I can't, uh, it, the time just flies. So I do want to uh, get on to the last issue that I said I would talk about tonight, which is the um, uh, Muslim teachings on women. And I explained uh, a little, a short while ago, why this is significant and why I have argued all this time that the ethnicity is not what you need to look at. You need to be looking at the religion, um, but which of course we won't do because we will, we will know. If we look in honesty at the religion, we'll know that it has a huge, huge influence on why these uh, crimes take place. So I'm going to go back to our friend Robert Spencer, rather than read from the Quran itself. Uh, and you know, remarkably, I, I thought to myself, uh, there, are, there are probably many on the far right who actually agree with some of this. Um, so I, if I, uh, I, I, I'm amazed uh, why thinking women can go along with this stuff, either from uh, the left's defence of, of Islam uh, or the uh, far right's uh, rather similar attitude towards us. But let's go at uh, the governing uh, surah in the Quran in terms of women is surah four and it is entitled the women. It is an owner's manual, quite simply. And because Robert Spencer is so, so good at this, I'll be nice and quick. He has already put together all the bits of the Quran uh, that I need to read out. So let's do that. So uh, Surah 434. Now, this is the most notorious of the anti-woman verses in the Quran. I have been told over the years by Muslim women and, and other apologists that it simply isn't there. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It is. 
anyone can pick up a book and read it. It's there. This is called reality. So, uh, Quran 434 is what I call the um, wife-beating verse. And actually, interestingly, Robert Spencer has split it into two, but I shall read it as one. It says, men have authority over women because God has made one superior to the other. God, good women are, are the obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. As for those from whom ye fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to beds apart and scourge them. Uh, scourge them means beat them. Other, other versions of the Quran say beat, others say strike. So what this is telling us is a couple of things. One, it's very, very clear that women are inferior. Uh, it says so. In, in, in plain language, God, Allah has created one superior to the other. Then it tells us very, very clearly that women are the property of men because they, and this is de, uh, uh, explained in the requirement that women are obedient to men. Now that means a couple of things. It means, of course, that women are inferior, but it also means an assumption that men are always right and women are always wrong. Uh, and it doesn't matter if the woman is 10 times smarter than than her husband or any other man in the vicinity. She's wrong and he's right, always, and she must obey. Guarding in secret that which Allah has guarded. I think it's obviously keeping uh, keeping herself chaste for her, <laughs> chaste until uh, until she, her her father owner hands her over to a new owner. Now here's a here's a key uh, sentence. As for those from he from whom ye fear rebellion, ye fear rebellion. So she doesn't even have to be rebellious or disobedient. You just have to fear she might be. And on those circumstances, admonish them, which is sit them down and give them a bloody good talking to, and banish them to beds apart. Refuse to sleep with them. I can't. That one always makes me laugh. I have to say, I doubt very much for a lot of Muslim wives that refusing to sleep with them is a terrible punishment, quite frankly, probably quite the opposite for many. But of course, finally, if none of that works, if she doesn't become obedient after you've had a good word, or sit down and had a stern talking to, if she doesn't come back into line after that, then you refuse to sleep with her uh, and then you beat her. That is Quran 434. The Quran, as uh, well, I'll go back to Robert Spencer's explanations. The Quran likens a woman to a field to be used by a man as he wills. Quote, your women are a tilth for you to cultivate. So go to your tilth as ye will. That is Quran 2223. It further declares that a woman's testimony is worth half that of a man, something else that is constantly denied. Yet there it is in plain English in the Quran. Uh, get to plain language. Uh, get two quote. Get two witnesses out of your own men, and if there are not two men, then a man and two women, such as ye choose for witnesses, so that if one of them errs, the other can remind her. Again, this, this absolute declaration that women are st totally stupid. Uh, back to uh, Surah 4. And this is uh, where it allows, this is what Robert Spencer uh, summarises, it allows men to marry up to four wives and have sex with slave girls also. If ye fear, quote, if ye fear that ye shall not be able to deal justly with the orphans, marry women of your choice, two, three or four. But if ye fear that ye shall not be able to deal justly with them, then only one or a captive that your right hands possess that will be more than suitable to prevent you from doing injustice. A captive that your right hands possess. I remember when Tommy Robinson had a discussion with Majid Nawaz about this on television and I remember Tommy's face when it was admitted that yes, this verse applies to slave girls and the capturing of non-Muslim women for rape. They are war booty. And if you are a society that won't bend down to Islam and Sharia, you are at war with Islam giving Muslim men the right to take uh, slave girls and beyond. There's, so, there's a lot more. And I, I want to repeat again because I can't read the entire Surah to you. Um, and and I, as I said at the last one, 
do read it in context because people tell me all the time you're taking that out of context and I acknowledge yes I am taking it out of context and and taking verses out of context like this doesn't you know it doesn't really have the doesn't portray it accurately I want people to go to the real context because only when you see the context only when you contextualize all of this do you really see the true horror of it. it yes contextualize it please please do read the whole thing because i can't demonstrate to you the true contempt either for women or non-muslims by simply picking out these verses the entire scripture must be read to fully understand the horror of this. Uh, uh, Robert Spencer goes on to say, Aisha, the most beloved of Muhammad's many wives, who he married when she was six, this is in the Hadiths, not in the Quran, admonished women, and this is from Aisha, she admonished women in no certain terms. And I quote, Oh, women folk, if you knew the rights your husbands have over you, every one of you would wipe the dust from your husband's feet with her face. We talk about child marriage. Now, there is a, a it is uh, because, largely because of the Hadith and, 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 and Muhammad marrying Aisha at six and consummating the marriage at nine. Uh, this is largely used uh, to justify child marriage. There is also a section in the Quran or a verse in the Quran which uh, uh, Robert Spencer points to, and it is this. If you are in doubt concerning those of your wives who have ceased menstruating, know that their waiting period shall be three months. The same shall apply to those who have not yet menstruated. This implicitly, actually explicitly permits the marriage to girls who have not yet menstruated. I have mentioned the um, wife-beating verse the hadiths are in many cases even more horrific than the quran in terms of non-muslims and in terms uh, of of women uh, just a couple uh, allah's just a couple of hadiths allah's messenger said if a woman calls his wife to bed to have sexual relations and she refuses and causes him to sleep in anger the angels will curse her till morning the husband is only obliged to support his wife when she gives herself to him or offers to meaning she allows him full enjoyment of her person and does not refuse him sex at any time of night or day for this reason ma rape within marriage is absolutely unheard of uh, we also have the spectre of things like uh, temporary wives in the Shia uh, tradition. I want to recommend to you because I can... Oh, finally, finally. Uh, I, I mentioned that a, a woman's testimony is worth half of a man's. Now, <coughs> if a woman is raped and if she goes to for seeking justice in this rape... Take into account that if she says, this guy raped me and he says, no, I didn't. Her testimony is worth half of his. This has resulted in the four male witnesses calamity or helped to result in the four male witnesses atrocity of injustice. In that, and this was the case in a law of the land in several Muslim countries, uh, and, and was the uh, notoriously so in Pakistan that if a this would call the Hudud laws, if a woman alleged rape to the police, uh, she and she couldn't produce four male Muslim witnesses. She is a and I quote the Quran. Why did they not produce four witnesses? Since they produce not witnesses, they verily are liars in the sight. Of Allah. So if she is raped and she can't produce four male Muslim witnesses, she is a liar in the sight of Allah. And catastrophically for her, she's likely to be charged with adultery, which carries the sentence of death by stoning. So it's a pretty much a lose lose situation for women and a rapist's charter. Again, I haven't really even touched the surface here. Uh, please do go and read it for yourself. So combination of contempt for non-Muslims, contempt for women, an absolute invitation to abuse non-Muslim women is throughout featured throughout Muslim scripture. And if we have an ounce of common sense, we ought to be looking at this religion and looking for answers as to why women are treated so badly in Muslim societies and as to why, when you have mass migration from such societies, they are going to treat our women and girls 
just as badly worse because they're not Muslims either. Five minutes left. Um, thank you for uh, all your comments and questions. Anything I don't uh, follow to, or uh, answer today, I will, I promise to, to come back to. Okay. Uh, did, 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 did. Uh, okay, just to just to let you know a couple of things. Uh, oh, oh, I need to mention, of course. Uh, just to let you know a couple of things. I am um, uh, from Monday. We're going to be uh, starting. I almost forgot this. We're going to be starting at half past seven. We're going to ch make the chi uh, time. A couple of people said um, half past seven, so we'll start at half past seven on Monday. And we've got a few changes to uh, to make uh, from next week. Okay, so finally tomorrow is as we know ve day and it is the 75th anniversary of the end of the of the second world war in europe it's his victory in europe day now i see around where i live uh union jack bunting going up there you know i've seen uh, several flags hanging outside people's houses and it's it's heartwarming to uh, to 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 see. I'm 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 oh I'm actually I'm I'm always I get a little bit emotional um, when I see <laughs> British bunting around the place. I know we're about to celebrate the country. What a nice change it is to celebrate the country, but of course we can't celebrate the way we would like to. We would like to have. Uh, street parties and and, uh, and community get-togethers and we would like to to really uh, celebrate Britain for a change but because of this hideous hideous lockdown and this hideous virus which is just wrecking everything <laughs> um, we are not able to celebrate properly but let's take let's take a moment I, I you know I'm going to take a, a private quiet moment to myself tomorrow and I'm going to make sure that I Think about and thank those who went before us, who fought in this terrible war. Uh, I'm going to think about the people who were around when that, when this, on the, on this day, 75 years ago. Think about how it must have felt, uh, the sacrifices they had made, uh, the the British spirit that was so alive at the time. Uh, and I'm going to take a little bit of, of uh, time, really, just to, to say a, a, a private, I, I, I often say private thank yous and, and quiet thank yous in my mind um, for, for good things in, in life. And um, I actually think it's quite a positive thing to do. Um, and I would encourage others to do the same. And I would encourage, uh, you know, if you t take to social media, perhaps, uh, let's, have a, let's have a celebration. Let's celebrate uh, Britain. And uh, let's do so in, in, in uh, honour of those who went before us, of those who fight and who serve the country in the military today. And of course, as always, for those who are yet to come and in, in, in honour and in memory of the Britain that we are fighting for. We are fighting for that British spirit that saw Britain through those terrible years. So do celebrate tomorrow. Uh, honour our, our forces, honour are uh, uh, the people who went before us uh, and, and remember them and their sacrifices. I shall certainly be doing so. Uh, I will get to the the questions um, and uh, I, I was having to get any, but I, I'm sure, I mean, I wanted, I, I said I would discuss these things and, and, and I think uh, it was an hour well spent. Uh, any questions I promise to get back to uh, on Monday. Uh, if I don't, uh, question me again. But that's it from me for this evening. It's five to eight. Uh, for those of you who uh, want to go and clap our key workers, please do. And I shall see you back here Monday evening at a slightly later time at of half seven. Uh, and let's see if people prefer that time. OK, thank you for tuning in, guys. Thank you for your company. And I shall see you next week. Take care until then. <laughs>